All right. It's time for the midterms. It is 6 p.m. where I am, which means that it is 8 p.m. on the East Coast. So we have a few polls closing. Uh, I don't see much of anything that's definitive yet. Uh, I was just looking at the New York Times tracker, and they they seem to have called some races that are not really contested. So we don't know much. And so I think we're still kind of in prediction mode, but I'm not going to actually have a long monologue tonight. Uh, instead, I'll just let people ask questions or even throw in some info, if you would like. Uh, that would actually be appreciated. I would also say this, and um, allow me just to spruik a little bit. So I will only be talking for one hour tonight on this Twitter space. But uh, if I will probably be talking for three to four, you know, so many hours uh, uh, with my Substack group. So if you go over to Radix Journal, R A D I X Journal. dot Substack. dot com, you can subscribe and then go down and look for our members calls. And um, we those are good. I think we'll have more tonight. We we have a few dozen people. So it's pretty lively, and we go on for a long time. They uh, generally get pretty epic. So you are welcome to subscribe. Um, anyway, let me give some predictions. I actually posted a little piece. I, I tried to, you know, everyone can kind of have their take on this stuff, and everyone's ultimately looking at the polls and the aggregated polls and Real Clear Politics or 538 or what have you. Uh, I tried to give a little bit of historical context to it all, uh, particularly in with with regard to the um, blue era of the 1930s, really up until the 1990s, and uh, the um, red era that is upon us, and that has lasted since the mid 90s and is still going. The blue era was characterized by democratic hegemony and wide margins, particularly in the House, but also the Senate, and lasting paradigmatic legislation, Civil Rights Act, Immigration Reform Act, the New Deal, the Square Deal, all of it. Um, even Obamacare was kind of like the last gasp of the red era. And that occurred when Democrats were in control of both houses. Um, the red era is defined by Republicans generally doing well uh, and also no legislative achievements. I, I mean, I'm not being sarcastic when I say that I, I genuinely cannot name something that the GOP has done. And it's actually, you know, the GOP has done quite well in uh, House elections and Senate elections since 1994. Birth stars, you know. Your Paul Ryan, your Newt Gingrich, other nerdy libertarians. And uh, I think the red era is going to have kind of like a Indian summer or something. Um, I do think the GOP is going to win. Uh, and we will see typical red era stuff coming out of Congress in the next two years, like uh, an abortion ban or uh, an impeachment of Joe Biden or stuff like that. Uh, <laughs> basically nonsense. And, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, if you can. Uh, but I don't think that can last. I think the general, there's a kind of new coalition that will be blue that's brewing that is going to include uh, quite a bit of upper and middle class white people in the suburbs and beyond. And if Trump gets on the ballot in 2024, which I think he will, that coalition will be fully operational. Uh, anyway, I will post, how do I post a tweet in here? Do you guys know? Oh, there we go. Uh, well, uh, anyway, uh, you can go to my account and read if you'd like, but anyone want to jump in? Um, Samuel, you're up first. What do we know? Or what do you know? 
or tell me something I don't know. Samuel, you have to unmute yourself. Okay, Samuel, if you're not going to speak, uh, anyone else want to jump in? Okay, um, I will mention this. I did see something very interesting on Twitter uh, just as I was about to get on, and that is the Miami-Dade County early vote. And, you know, just like everything in our society, it is polarized. So Donald Trump says the early voting's fake or you can't trust it. Don't vote early. Vote on the day of. Um, that's I guess I took his advice. I just kind of blank voting on the day of. <laughs> I mean, it, it's not I live in a small town, so it, you know, takes 15 or 20 minutes to do it. But um, anyway, Miami-Dade counting count, Miami-Dade County, the early vote was really strongly Republican. Uh, so that is pretty remarkable in itself. Uh, and it also does, you know, just it's one bit of information, but it does suggest a red wave. Okay, Samuel, do you want to try again or would someone else like to speak? No, no, no. Thank you. Sure. Bye. He doesn't want to speak. All right, guys. No, no, I don't. Oh, I don't. What do you want to say, man? Jump in. No, no, nothing. Thank you. All right. Um, don't ask to be a speaker then. All right. Anyone else want to jump in? Or are we just kind of too early on this deal? All right. Well, guys, you need to ask me questions, okay? So ask me a question. There we go. All right. <laughs> All right. Steve L., Hey Richard, um, I was. Oh, hey Steve, how are you doing? Yeah, uh, doing well. I was going to ask you about what you think of the issue of the economy and inflation being a a center issue. Seems like in this debate, and why the Republicans will probably win. It, it's sort of funny to me because it seems like they're going to win on that issue, even though they have no plans to make anything better. You know, they right. <laughs> they. they um, they have no economic legislation or things like that. How is it that like they're able to people focus in on this one thing? Is it going to trump all the other issues? Um, because it's deeply there's this this like psychological character to elections in general. And I think midterms in particular, actually, where the midterm just becomes a referendum on who is perceived to be in power. I mean, it is a bit ridiculous to think that Joe Biden sets gas prices. Like it, it was, I mean, he kind of does in the sense that he can release some strategic reserves, but the, you know, he can't do that. And uh, this idea of blaming him for that is kind of like id brained or, you know, animalistic or something. And again, as I as I've mentioned many times, there's just this weird psychological effect where the party that is in power loses in the midterm, particularly in the first uh, term midterm. And I, I don't I mean, you, you, the other side is, is I mean, or the side that lost is mo greater mobilized. There's general dissatisfaction or just like some quest for balance or something. I don't know what it is, but it just is such a strong effect. It is like, you know, those weird statistics where like, if the Phillies wear their alternative uniform while they're on the road, they always lose or something. It's, it's just some weird like thing that's like consistent, but just doesn't seem very rational. And yeah, I mean, I don't, the, the Republicans don't have a plan for inflation other than just to talk about it and blame it on Biden. And uh, but inflation is bad and that seems to dominate things. Uh, I, I was a little bit surprised because, as you might know, like, let's say two months ago or or maybe even sooner, I was kind of itching to say that this was going to be a blue wave just on the basis of Roe v. Wade, because I, I really and remember you know, in Kansas on a, on a pro uh, choice referendum, it won with like 60% of the vote or maybe even higher than that. 
And so you could say that there was just like some overriding single issue that was going to bring people out, but it just never materialized. And we just kind of went back to this default where the party out of power does well and people blame the president for, you know, their grocery bills being high. So yeah, uh, it just is what it is. I mean, inflation could get worse next year and Republicans will st- still like run on, you know, oh, we got to get Biden out of there. <laughs> so, you know, it just is what it is. Um, it's just kind of we, I don't know, we, we operate on a kind of non-rational basis to a degree to which we don't like to admit. And I think that's definitely playing out today. Okay. Um, you can stay in here, Steve, if you want to uh, chat and um, jump in again. So Moz Pill, you have the floor. I was just curious, like what it was about um, Toronto that I'm not here to lecture you about your personal choices, but I was just wondering like why you decided to vote for Toronto. Like, Oh, Trinnell, Monica Trinnell. Tr- yeah, sorry. Oh, it's no. fine. I might even be pronouncing it incorrectly. Um, yeah, I mean, I think she's, first off, just as candidates go, I think she's a very high quality candidate. She's former Olympic athlete, you know, wow. Um, she was a former Republican also, which is not terribly surprising in Montana. I mean, in Montana, it's, I mean, I remember I, I just watched the debate between her and Zinke and, I just like, it was like doing homework. Um, It's just not very salacious. And I think Montana is a state where, you know, there have been a lot of Democrats elected statewide for governor, for Senate and things like that. And there's just this kind of residual, like pre-polarization element to Democrats because it's, it's nothing like Alabama where things are highly polarized and highly racialized. It's just not like that due to kind of obvious factors. It's a it's a small state. We now have two congressmen (laughs) and uh, it's, I think, 86 percent white or something. And it's a kind of just leave me alone state. It's just it's just more laid back. Um, And uh, again, a major minority group is um, Native Americans. So it's just a totally different thing. And uh, but Monica Trinnell seems like a good person. And um, I do think that an abortion ban is going to be attempted in the next Congress. And Biden will surely veto it. But I do think they'll attempt it. And if they get Trump in, surely they would actually do it in 2024. So it is pretty serious. And uh, she's good on that issue. I think, you know, overall, putting aside some of the stuff that I can't stand Democrats are generally better. And uh, Zinke, I don't really care about the scandal. I mean, it's like the great whitefish <laughs> land scandal of 2019 or whatever. It's like, I'm just not that uh, motivated or scandalized by, like, I don't know, trying his family would benefit from the sale of a sledding park. <laughs> it's like kind of funny to even talk about. It's just I don't find that too bothersome, but I generally don't like him and uh, definitely voted for Monica Trinnell. So we'll see. I don't know what's going to happen. We, we, again, we previously had a statewide congressional district. Now we have two congressional districts. I, to be honest, I don't even know what this one covers, but if it includes like Missoula and others, I actually could see Monica Trinnell winning. On the lesbian vote alone. Just kidding. Okay. Anyone else want to jump in? Hello, Richard. Hey. Um, apparently Elon Musk is trying to steal my phone number. <laughs> what? Oh, he's doing yeah. to get verified? Yeah, basically, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's I... like everyone has to pay to get a new account or whatever. This is a freaking phone ver- uh, verification. Well... I mean, I'm of two minds of this. Um, I, I had a verification badge and I won it back. Uh, Mm -hmm. It was, you know, so they, they kind of did this post Charlottesville where I, I guess I should be happy that I wasn't kicked off altogether. Um, 
Jack has been fairly lenient because he knows that I obey the TOS and so on. I think Jack Dorsey, I, again, as I've said this before, I, I get the criticism of him from all mm-hmm. sides, actually. He's kind of actually hated. I see leftists hating him. I, anyway, and, and rightists are like, oh, you know, big tech. Or whatever. But yeah. um, I, I actually don't think he's that bad. And I do think he genuinely believes in free speech, like uh, uh, as yeah. a principle. So I, I, I think Jack is, was not that bad. And I think he, I had a special dispensation and someone actually told me that who had interviewed him, a journalist. So who knows if that's true or not and who knows <laughs> whether it will last. But um, so I generally like the idea of doing this, but I, I don't know. It, it also strikes me as just kind of unworkable. You know, people are not used to paying for a service like this. Yeah. You know, people will pay nine bucks for Netflix and you could probably even raise it to like 20 or something and they would yeah. still do it. But Twitter, you know, I, I don't, it's just, I, I don't know. And um, I will do it, um, mm-hmm. but I don't know if it's a successful business model and I don't know how he's going to monetize this thing in a yeah. way that's good. And his, like his tweet has been insane. I mean, I just oh, look yeah. at this and I'm just like, what in the hell are you doing, my dude? I mean, you are, you look like an idiot. You look like someone who is shooting from the hip and just yeah. like reacting to things. And there's no consistency. What he says is inconsistent. It's like, oh, I love free speech. And then it's like, well, I'm going to piss off the far right and the far left. And then it's like, let me tell you how to vote. Vote Republican. And then yeah. it's like, <laughs> comedy is now legal. And then it's like, no parodies. Like, I'm banning this. It just doesn't make any sense. I mean, I I don't want to endorse these conspiracy theories, but yeah, um, it, the whole thing was weird. And oh, yeah. the trying to buy the network, you know, in, in some ways out of rage after he was, after there was pushback to him buying into the network by buying a lot of stock. And then trying to get out of it. I mean, I don't know if there's any explanation. Like, oh, he's playing 5D chess or whatever. What are you talking about? He was clearly trying to get out of the deal. Mm-hmm. Then being going to court and getting embarrassed a little bit by having some of the early discovery released, but mm-hmm. maybe not like totally embarrassed. And then yeah. getting back in it, and none of it makes sense. It just... I don't know what he's doing. And there are these conspiracy theories of like, oh, he's, he's going to try to, or other people are using him to destroy Twitter, which almost seems plausible. Yeah. And, uh, you know, some other things. I, I don't know. The whole Jeffrey Sachs thing is, is kind of interesting. Hmm. I, I don't know. And, and there's Saudi Arabia bought in. I mean, there's just lots of weird things going on. I now, don't people... know. How... Go ahead. Oh yeah, a lot of people forget Musk's background, like uh, that his family was like, um, you know, had had something, you know, some political involvement in the downfall of apartheid. Interesting. Mm. Yeah, people kind of forget that. It's like, hmm, <laughs> kind of kind of coming into this space. I think Elon taking over has given lots of people hope, until they realize that the only billionaires who are here to free us are fictional characters such as Batman and Iron Man. Adam Green and his fan yeah. base have been banned since this whole takeover has happened. And the ha- Adam Green got banned? And his, um, and his good amount of... Uh, we've created a little bit of um, a community. People who have been hip to this whole thing and then that then that this happens in cahoots with the kanye and Kyrie thing is also yeah. interesting and then because most- adam green i mean granted adam green is doing content that is very critical of israel so i mean i know why and Ju- judaism and so on so i i know why he was banned or at least i think i do but at the same time like i've never i followed him i never saw him do anything like totally outrageous or too edgy or whatever. whatever. That that is a very 
that's bad sign. And, and when people do come out and do things that are calling out all of Judaism as a problem, such as Kanye West, what he did, he um he did a broad stroke. He says, I'm going DEFCON 3, which is it's not even the right thing to say DEFCON, but... Um, right. He, he said, Insane on, statement, basically. Uh, he, said yeah. on, he said on Jewish people all together as a whole. If you look at um, the founding father of Zionism, a Herzl, he said that anti-Semitism is our greatest ally. And you yeah. see how they cook it up. And what Kanye West's whole thing does, I mean, that's a little conspiratorial. But what it did do was it, cr- it gave a lot more of a mouthpiece to Greenblatt and the ADL. And it shut down freedom of speech. And that fact, I'm thinking about this now, that it happens as we're going into the midterms. And in midst of the whole Kanye and Kyrie um, fiasco. Your thoughts, my dearest Richard? Yeah, well, I mean, Kanye, you know, you, Kanye and, and um, Kyrie are, are doing the jobs that uh, white men won't, which is engage in uh, hyper anti-Semitism and Zionism. I don't know what to say. I mean, I, I've talked a little bit about Kanye and Kyrie. I've talked about it a, num- a number of times, actually. I mean, I, I basically, I think I agree with your general sentiment. I mean, I'm not on board with this stuff. It's weird. There's a- It's Black theory. Hebrew Israelite. So we're the chosen ones. I mean, exactly it's as stupid. Yeah. yeah. And I actually did a, I, I think I did a, um, something that's on Substack. I think most of it is- Behind, oh, oh, or in front of the paywall. Uh, yeah, it's Black Israel, Israelitism or Black um, Egyptology, I remember it was a thing in the 90s. Um, it's it's pretty bizarre. Um, I do think there's a genuine element to it. I do think that there's a kind of Christian ambivalence that naturally emerges. Um, and so I, I think there is, it, it is genuine, but I can kind of, you know, I probably I, I might I might not sign off on your theory, but I kind of I do see what you're saying. Where it's like there does need to, you know, the irony of Zionism is that it does legitimize itself on the basis of anti-Semitism. I mean, without anti-Semitism, would the ADL would Jonathan Greenblatt have a job? And so the more that he cooks it up, right, the the more money he gets funded and. So and the more kind go. of outlandish, the better, in a way. I mean, there's a trope, which we all know what that means, of um, what are you doing, Rabbi, when there's like swastikas spray painted on gravestones or on college campuses, like, oh, the, look who was behind it, an actual uh, somebody. Yeah, well, that can happen. There, there have been a lot of hoaxes on campus, but I, I wouldn't suggest that that um, that it never necessarily, happens. yeah, that it's necessarily a hoax, but yeah, uh, I, I definitely see your point. I mean, I, I think you are getting at this, like, you know, contradiction at the heart of Zionism. Another contradiction is that you had all of these mostly Protestant Christians who were fanatically in favor of Zionism, almost out of an anti-Semitism where, I mean, Churchill's famous essay, Bolshevism or, nationalism like (laughs) i forgot what the exact title is you can just google it uh that was an expression of that mood it's basically we you know these people are engaging in in communistic subversion so we better make them nationalists by sending them to israel so it's a kind of anti-semitic justification for zionism in many Uh, ways so it's or the the havera agreement are you familiar with that not quite what is that so the Havera Agreement, H-A-A-V-E-R-A, is something that the Zionists struck up in accordance with the Nazis run oh, by no, Adolf I, I, to I bring the, the Germans to create the state of Israel. And what, was the, what came about after World War I and World War II, the establishment of the state of Israel? When they tried to leave Israel, they blew up their own ships so that they couldn't leave. All right, I'm going to let you go. Um, okay. I Thank love you, you man. for your comments. Thank you. Right. Uh, let's talk about the midterms. <laughs> uh, yeah. we, could go, we could get into that. But anyone want to jump in on midterms issue? Uh, 
Yakub, you can if you'd like. Here I am. Yes. Okay. Um, I uh, I should say right off the bat, I am not um, a devotee of the uh, my pillow faction. I uh, you know think Trump lost and everything, sure. but um, I am annoyed by this taking a month to count votes, as I know you are. Yeah. Um, what do you think are some of the best arguments for just getting it done on election night, like Florida? Well, I think the best argument for um, I, I think a good argument is that we should have same day voting and that absentee ballots should be pretty rare. They should be, you know, you're a businessman abroad or you're in the military or, or you know, you're too old to leave the house or, what, you know, but that, that's like a small percentage. The thing is, a, an election is an event. It's like the Super Bowl. You don't like count practice yards for the Super Bowl. <laughs> you know, if you practice really well you get three extra points or something. That's not how it works. It happens on that day. And that includes all the randomness and contingency of that day, including does it, is it going to rain or not? I mean, that's, I know that's a factor. And, you know, maybe if like a, a hurricane wiped out Miami, I might be inclined to be like, all right, let's redo this in a month or something. That, that seems reasonable. But generally speaking, you know, you just got to go, like you got to do it. It's an event. It's a sport. And None of this, like, long, you know, month-long polling of what you believe at that time. No, it's what you believe on November 8th. And I think when you get away from that, you just, you do lose something um, essential about democracy. I, I think that's my argument. I mean, it's, it's personal preference on some level, but it's, you know, I'm right. And... I do. I also do think that like there's so much tension. It is good to get the voting done, you know, that night, and um, so on. And and you know, I again, I'm not a my pillow guy. I'm not Dinesh D'Souza. But you know, to be fair, I, I could imagine some, you know, vote harvesting going on with uh, absentee ballots. So you know, uh, I that that's what I that's what I believe. It's mostly you know. It's mostly kind of a personal preference, I have to say, but that is my argument. Yeah, that all makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm kind of wondering what exactly this thing is. I'm kind of trying to agree with you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sort of wondering what is it about the snapshot that is um, that is so valuable to democracy? Because I kind of share the intuition. Mm -hmm. um, that it certainly produces more more confidence in results, and I, I think, I mean, it wouldn't necessarily end polarization, but it would um, it would reduce a little bit this kind of you know these months of anxiety before and after, where yes. everyone is thinking about how much they hate the other side. You know, what? I'll go with that. That that's the best argument in my book. <laughs> You're just increasing the duration of anxiety, basically, by doing this uh, long-term voting. Yeah. Also, I, you know, I, again, I, I think you also have to just get off your ass, you know, like, just, you know, figure out where the polling place is and walk to it, you know, like, okay, this is, you know, I, I think we're all pretty cynical about the American electoral pro process, but that doesn't mean that we should just make it worse, you know, <laughs> and like you can vote from your smartphone or whatever. I just, there's something that I just find, again, it, it, this sounds a lot like a personal preference as opposed to an argument, but nevertheless, I'm right. I mean, I, there's just something about the whole thing. Like it's, it's a civic duty you should take this seriously. Yeah. There's not an app that you download or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, you might not see many people who vote for the other party. Of course, in this space, we probably have both Republican and Democrat voters. But generally in American life, people are pretty siloed. And, you know, having to wait politely in line with people yeah. of the other party, exercising their uh, power, um, you know, it sounds like a good exercise as far as citizenship uh, I totally goes. agree. Yeah. You see someone there who you know is voting and for the other side, but you're not attacking them or something. 
I think that's, yeah, that's a great argument. Um, well, I just, before, before, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. I was saying, before I turn my mic off, I just, just have some anecdotes you may or may not find interesting. Um, the last time I voted, it was in a conservative area. And um, the, uh, you know, probable boomer, maybe late Gen X or early Gen X, older Gen X, a blonde lady. She's a poll worker and she's not supposed to say this, but you know, I'm a white guy. And um, I think she already knew that I was voting a Republican primary. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, but she starts talking about like, oh, you know, we can't have any more fraud. And I'm like, Jesus, come on. Like, do not bring this in here. Um, and uh, I guess a, a detail, I mean, it's, that's such awful misbehavior, but um, just a detail that this, uh, this crowd might find interesting is I voted in this like Jewish Christian hybrid church. Well, the, yeah, these things are out there where, um, I don't know exactly what they're, well, I probably have an idea. It's probably something Do you live like in Florida. I guess I you don't have to talk. Opsec, <laughs> opsec. Okay. I'll say it's a purple. I'll say it's a purple state. I'll okay. say it's a purple state. That seems um, like the place where I could imagine that existing, but I don't know. Oh no, it's it's an atmosphere like the atmosphere you're thinking of. But yeah, this yeah. is I, I I imagine it's some kind of dual covenant or. Um, maybe Noahide type thing. I mean, they, uh, you can't tell the Christians that it's idolatry and that uh, they can't be Christian under Noahide laws. But anyway, we don't have to go off in Adam Green territory. But yeah, they have this like Jewish Christian church where, um, you know, they have Hebrew letters on the sign. And I mean, these are like affluent white truck driving suburban people. But um, yeah, that's... I think that's the way it's headed. That's the milieu. You know? Yeah, I mean, that. I think there are almost like two ways that evangelical Christianity can move. One is towards what you're describing, just literal Judeo-Christian values type stuff, but, but on, in a kind of primitive or fundamentalist way. And then the other way, the direction of evangelical Christianity is towards like, Joel Osteen megachurch stuff where it's about like making money and voting Republican and Trump is our savior and just, just goofy, you know, stuff. I, I think it's, but, but in a weird way, kind of secular. <laughs> um, I, I think those are the two directions of evangelicals and both of them are horrible. Anyway. Um, okay. So, Richard, I, I was going to ask you, um, Sure. is there any sort of um, politician out there that you would like to see lead the Democratic Party? Is there any person? Politician out there, like, um, you know, state or federal level? Um, uh, you know, all of them are kind of flawed in their way. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I will admit a certain liking of Gavin Newsom. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I could get behind that. Now there, there are, there are, there are a lot of pro I mean, it, it's one of these things where there, there's kind of a turd in the punch bowl of both parties. And so it's a question of like, which is the bigger turd, you know, so with Republicans, you know, I mean, look, on, I, I am not a prude nor a religious right person, but uh, yeah, look, a lot of the kind of extreme stuff that we're seeing, like, I, I yeah, it bothers me too. And, yeah, as much uh, as me. <laughs> so, yeah, so I kind of get that. Uh, now, remember, transsexuality increased tenfold while Trump was in office. So, mm -hmm. you know, don't tell me that it's going to like vanish into thin air when we, if you reelect him or something. Uh, so a lot of that stuff bothers me too. Um, I do think Democrats are kind of on the whole, just better 
And mm-hmm. there's just so much, I don't know, there, there's just, the Republican Party has just embraced like stupidity and conspiracy theories and nonsense to a degree where I, I just, I feel like I'm back in 2003 or something when I was a lot younger, but, mm-hmm. but I was, I was an adult and I was reading blogs and all that kind of stuff. And it was the height of the Bush era. And I was just like, I fucking cannot stand these people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think the Republican party, enough, you could almost say the Republican party is pretty much stayed the same in many respects. Yes. Um, but there is one thing it's like, you know Kanye is kind of who he is but there's always just something about him where it's like I, I, I've I, always it's like during the Bush years I felt like it, there was a bit more of kind of like a normalcy of like I felt like conservatism was somewhat more normal but you know I mean it kind of got a little distracted you know going into the Middle East but um, like, like it was like Kanye was kind of more of someone like, like you would see the stuff on the left and i remember you made this point uh, in a previous space like you would see this stuff kind of more on the left and that now you have people like kanye and candace kind of mimicking us <laughs> but like, yeah yeah it, it's like um there's somewhat of a reversal or it's, i i would more or less just say the republican party is just you know doubling down and kind of discarding you know what you're definitely seeing it more well it's well it's a be, shibboleth yeah. like i mm-hmm. i've said I've, I've said this in in other maybe in other spaces right i've certainly said this in other recordings that i made there, there it's a shibboleth where if you don't pronounce something correctly you're out and they this is a technique of to be frank just goofy dumb people to eliminate the intelligent from their yep. midst and I just mean that very seriously. And, you know, as I've said to the other group, like even what, in our own circles, I mean, yeah. oh, yeah, even with your own circle, if you offer kind of nuance or like you kind of are open to something, you know, it's like, oh, cock or like you're, you're, you're a shell. You have you have intelligence. <laughs> yeah. And, and like, again, am I a fan of Liz Cheney? No, I am not. All right. I probably disagree with her on more certainly on more issues than I disagree with Gavin Newsom, actually. But, like, I could talk with her. You know, she's intelligent. She's, like, a person, you know? <laughs> and, like, they, there's this way where it's like, oh, she, you know, she went against Trump or she's, she went against J6 or whatever. Like, let's, exactly. let's just get rid of her. And so you promote these loons who are 100%. not as intelligent, and, but they, they say the shibboleth right. That is a really bad dynamic that is a toxic dynamic for me on some level i I think this is sort of like kind of part of the thing but um in 2016 i was initially more you know you know you know as as i am christian you know kind of more or less aligned with kind of the social like I, I was pretty black pilled after the 2015 ruling on gay marriage. I was just like, "This country's done." Mm-hmm. But I was, I had a little bit of Ted Cruz, but I, I initially was more anti-Trump. I kind of had more healthier instincts where I'm just looking at this guy. I'm just like, "This guy's not like." I, I I was eventually won over. Like, okay, this guy is sort of like you know rallying the white vote, but. Yes. Um, I was I had some instincts where I was like, this guy's not uh, well. And people said this at the time, like, you know, like, oh, it's not his character, you know, this that, and that. But th- I'm like, this guy's a billionaire and there's not much kind of like I, I, w- I sense that kind of the older Republicans. Uh, this was another point I was getting to. It's kind of the the boomers were, were not. It's like, like what we're seeing now is a lot worse than boomers. Like at least boomers would kind of like, you know, maybe study like a, a history documentary and get some things right. right. Um, it's, like, it's actually funny because I think I remember this going back, you know, even with the 2012 election, I think you'd probably trace it back to like Bush and Obama, where it, it's sort of like the boomers are sort of passing away. 
and you're and this is something you're you know clearly seeing in the elections where you know especially on the republican side where you know you're seeing um you know kind of whites fade away from kind of being the uh candidates in a lot of these races maybe you know it'll be interesting if the democrats become um i remember tucker carlson did like a clip where he's like oh what was it he was like um you know like it's like you don't know if he's being ironic or not but he's like you know he's he's like feeling sorry for kamala harris and saying that the democrat party is going to be taken over by all these white guys (laughs) (laughs) right Right. yeah um but but this is what it is and and i i talked about this a lot and i i need to get this down on paper uh but in, in the 90s, Sam Francis wrote this pamphlet, actually, which I have a copy of. I don't even know. You could probably I don't know, find it on eBay or something. It, it yeah. is pretty rare, but he mm-hmm. really summed it all up. It's, it's um, called Ethnopolitics. And he was basically prophesizing or prophesying the, the, the Southern strategy on steroids. And it's like, the, and, and I think in a way... 15 years later with the tea party, he, he was kind of proved right after his mm-hmm. death. And that is that the GOP just has to be the white party. And, you know, for, for Francis, I mean, he, he, he kind of got, uh, you know, at, at odds with some of his libertarian and uh, colleagues when he was just like, yes, we should have national socialism. Like we should just, there's this middle American population that is socially conservative and fiscally liberal, and we should just have a party based on them. It is the middle American radical party, uh, this kind of stuff. And I, you could see that in the Tea Party where it was, um, you know, 90% of Republican votes came from whites. Uh, the Tea Party had some minority uh, speakers or whatever, but yeah, it was just a totally so white that was thing. From- that was from the Bush era as well. Yeah. Uh, but he, but, he but the, this of... is the interesting thing. I think this might be a narrative coming out of this because uh, coming out of the, the midterms is that the GOP, it's not so much white. It is a certain kind of personality profile. And so in that actually, that personality profile contains a quite a bit of Hispanics Mm -hmm. and maybe even some Asians and blacks, black men in particular. And so when these guys like Marco Rubio or Steve Bannon, and they talk about like a multiracial working class coalition, they're not wrong. They're talking about the future of the party. (laughs) Yeah. And so it's, it, it, you know, it's like if you're a small business owner on down, you are likely to be a Republican. If you are a professor, if you're a lawyer, if you're a physician, if you are a journalist, certainly, if, mm-hmm. you know, on <laughs> up, you are a Democrat. And yeah. that, so it's a middle coalition. It's not ever been really racial. But I do think that a lot of the Southern strategy stuff will persist, in fact. Mm-hmm. Uh, the kind of, they don't need to change their ideology, really, but they'll just kind of like keep going with this. But I do think that there's going to be a lot of talk of like, the whitening of the democratic party and the hispanicization of the republican party and again Mm -hmm. i've said this so many times i feel like i'm one of the few people to say it i have seen i think jack had been kind of picked up on this a little bit anyway in donald trump won a smaller percentage of the white vote than Mitt romney and you I, i say that no one people it just washes over them like water off a duck's back in 2016 he, he, or 2020? 2016. He, oh, and 2020. He won a smaller percentage. The only, He increased his uh, voter turnout among Hispanics and black men in both elections. So, like, in this both. is the great irony of the Trump campaign, which began by calling Hispanics racist and ended by having, you know, living in Florida and having a Hispanicized <laughs> I mean, it's like doing the Muslim ban thing and then uh, having Dr. Oz. (laughs) You right. Right. Yeah. It's it's like everyone forgot. It was just like a seamless, you know, 
<laughs> Suddenly they're like pro Uyghur and then, you know, the, you got Dr. Oz. Yeah. So it's just bizarre. But I do think that that's a, a real thing. And again, to go back to the Shibola thing that I was talking before, I mean, again, you're, you're going to, if you are a middle party, this is what the GOP and populism in particular is. It's not white. It's a personality profile. Let's say 100 mm-hmm. IQ and thereabouts. Okay, that's fine. But if that is what you have and you are at war with top and the bottom, you're going to lose in a pincer like yeah. movement. If you are at war with the professional class, they're smarter than you. Yeah. Just say it. They're going to manipulate you. A. B. Uh, you are driving out. I mean, when I, again, in the 90s, when I was like, uh, you know, a teenager and kind mm-hmm. of becoming aware of things, Republicanism meant that you were like a lawyer or, yeah. you know, yeah, like you're, yeah, like you're a rich guy or what, you know, or like, you know, oh, he, he's such a conservative, like, you know, he, he, he wears uh, uh tweed or whatever. He must be a Republican or something. That, okay, that is gone. And you, there, you know, maybe for, for some people it's like good riddance or whatever. Okay. But like, you don't want to just kick out and alienate every intelligent person. And if you promote Kanye West and the My Pillow guy, that is exactly what you are going to fucking do. Exactly. <laughs> Certainly worked with me. Yep. <laughs> It is kind of interesting looking at some of these uh, Rust Belt races where um, you, you do sort of have like, um, I, I remember you kind of said this about Oz and Fetterman. Um, it, it's also kind of s- similar in Ohio where you have uh, J.D. Vance who, you know, comes from kind of the Silicon Valley background, I think supported Hillary Clinton and then mm-hmm. is now, you know, the, 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 Trump populist candidate, and then yeah. the opponent was, um, I think his, the, he succeeded someone who was actually kind of a, um, almost a kind of, like a pop, like a very populist Democrat who, um, you know, even had some uh, very good positions on Ukrainian refugees. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, uh, and, um, you know, was had a, pretty good foreign policy in relation to um, a, a Middle Eastern state. But uh, Tim Ryan is kind of like a similar example. Like he's portraying yeah, he's himself good. as, yeah, as a MAGA guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. He's good. Like Tim Ryan. And he looks normal. The, he doesn't look what's like What's the he, problem yeah. with Tim Ryan? Yeah, exactly. And he, he like doesn't alienate smart people, but then he kind of sounds a lot like a um, – working class person i don't quite know what his background is maybe you know a lot of these people they have wealth to some degree or another but including fetterman uh but you know he doesn't like alienate anyone and and, but then he talks i i thought he ran a very good campaign i mean whether he wins or not you know we'll find out but uh you know he he just kind of made fun of jd vance he's like you know like i know guy like all the people i know from my high school they would have beaten you up, JD Vance. Like I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like it's like pure dark branded energy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, right, I think looks that... more like a Trump voter in my like, like or at least yeah. the you know the the early Trump voter. You know. Yeah. Well, that was the Trump voter because I mean it's like it's former Obama voters who voted for Trump in the Midwest in the Rust Belt in 2016. That is the original trump voter yep and, and then J- jd vance is the new the new republican <laughs> exactly exactly he's the he's the religious right ted cruz also, order or something who's like trump's a fascist way, it's also kind of a reversal because he is more he is an elite he does come from he, he's kind of the new republican voter who's kind of like from the more elite background and tim ryan's kind of more middle class you know mm-hmm um, and what's funny in my state, I noticed this back in 2018 during the midterms. It, you know, um, our current uh, governor, Jay uh, Pritzker, <laughs> uh-huh. um, you know, comes. It's a fairly wealthy family. Um, I think 
like his one of his relatives is like a Republican donor, you know. Um, but um, it, it's interesting because like in our race, it's like it's weird because the uh, the it's kind of almost Trump like. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Pritzker is almost kind of like a Democrat version of Trump. <laughs> yeah. Like a billionaire type. And anyway, have, let's, yeah. let's do this. I'm going to, because I have to go pretty soon, I'm going to let some other people talk. So DeSantis lied. Okay. Wow. For a man. I'm very <laughs> curious to hear what you have to say. Okay. Go for it. No, I just got a few things really quick I wanted to tell you. Jumping back sure. to the Miami Republican thing. I'm from Miami. I've lived here my whole life. I needed to jump in and let you know, like, the cubans that live here they actually i would not say that it's just a like the republican thing is a personality trait i do think there's a racial component to it i've known cubans mm-hmm. here my whole life and they think some of them, i don't want to overgeneralize a lot of them actually believe that they're like the white man because they're like caucasian like they think oh I'm, I'm just like trump they'll think that like there's a it's a little bit like it's not like a thing interesting where yeah, yeah. I was going to say you should yeah. research this and look into it because they're not like other Hispanic groups. They'll actually identify with white people. So, and that's like, yeah. they have well, I know this because that. half of my family is Cuban. Um, and I've kind of noticed this growing up. It's like, um, what's interesting is like a lot of, uh, probably since the 60s, um, one of the main things that Cubans to kind of align with the Republican Party was like a lot of them will blame JFK for not giving air support during the the Bay of Pigs. Um, (laughs) So for a long time, they've traditionally been Republican. I mean, I would be, it it is kind of interesting and they they are kind of like an early example of Hispanics aligning with the Republican Party. But I Um, think this is a general trend is what I would say. I, I, I think it's it might be peculiar among the Cubans and Florida, yeah. but I think it's a general trend that Hispanics are kind of a model minority in the sense that they want to assimilate with that like broad MAGA population. Yeah. And so I think this is a real thing. It's going to happen. And so, again, you're going to have this like high low coalition within the Democratic Party um, and this middle coalition within the GOP. Mm -hmm. Um, Anyway, just have a couple more minutes. Let me, uh, Jord, do you want to jump in? No. Hey, yeah, I just, uh, I just had a question really. Or Horde, excuse me. If you you can hear me right. Yeah, I can hear you. Great. Um, I I just, I'll be honest with you, a long time listener, first time caller. I'm like, Uh I've followed you you for years, obviously. Um, But I'm, Le- I'm less familiar with the recent Dicky lore, if you know what I mean. Like, how, it, how much of this is you just being contrarian versus? How, okay, that's the wrong. That's the wrong, that's the wrong question. Let me rephrase. Uh, how, are you still pro white? Like in the in the in the mo- in the most basic sense, like without being part of the movement. I understand your uh, gripes and reservations with the broader movement, if you like. But like at a fundamental level, do you still care about white people? Yes. And in, okay. in, in our civilization, yes. And you see but, your current political strategy, tweetings, writings as being effective, or is it just a kind of fuck you to, to those guys kind of thing? Which, by the way, I don't hate you for. Like, I get it. I'm just wondering. Um, I Yes, I, I do think that getting away from seeing populism as our future or something like that or as beneficial to us is extremely important. And uh, the populist will make the wrong decision no matter what. And I don't think you should assume that like the Tories or MAGA or whatever is pro-white. Uh, no, no, I think I think um, for most people in, on our side of the fence, if you like, in, ter- in terms of issues like demographics, see a vote for the GOP or a vote for the as a vote for the lesser of two evils, better the devil you know perhaps right as opposed to i don't think it's the lesser of two evils 
and you have no kind of deeper reservations, animosities, feeling bad. Okay, like people like me who aren't like solely invested in the movement, like my uh, opinion of you is not formed by whatever shit people are talking this week, right? Like I'll take time. Uh, and I think I represent right. a, a, a large majority of people. Do you ever worry that people like me will get the wrong idea when we read things like I just voted to tax weed? And <laughs> like, it's like, really, really, <laughs> do you know, you don't think like... <laughs> well, I'm anti-weed in general, so that's why I voted to tax Yeah, but you it, see but... how it's perhaps not the most pressing issue of our day, Richard, right? Well, <laughs> well, no, but it was the only referendum issue that was on the ballot, so that's why I mentioned it. Um, I actually voted to um, not uh, legalize weed in Montana, and I, lo- I like, totally lost. It won by like 60% or some horrible thing. Uh, but no, I don't care. And like, the people who are good will follow and, or at least understand what I'm doing. And I can alienate and separate myself from the uh, grugs. So it's okay. a win-win. Well, that was really, that was really <laughs> the, cru- the crux of my question. Thank you for your time, I guess. That was a... Sure. All right. Little Miss, uh, you, we just have about five minutes. So uh, go. Hi, Richard. I just have a quick question. Um, it relates to Charlottesville. What are your thoughts five years later well, I would probably need a lot of time to talk I know, about but do that. you regret going? Do you regret going? And what about the recent wave of doxes that have come about? I don't quite know about those. I mean, look, if I had a time machine, I probably wouldn't do it. But, you know, time machines don't exist. And it was, at least from my standpoint and the people that I was around and knew, it was a totally legitimate thing. Um, now, I think there are, like there were deeper problems within the movement and there was probably deeper problems within my own thinking, you know, to be fair, but, you know, sometimes you have to become aware of those. Uh, but at the same time, I'm not going to say that, you know, Oh, you know, it, it was some terrible thing. I mean, in many ways it, it was a, a very good thing in, 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 you know, in, in some of its motivations. Now I, again, I, I think, the, the white nationalist movement or the whatever, I, I just, I don't think you can really work with them because it's, there are, there are people who want to do these things in order to get in fistfights. And, you know, I, 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 I've said this, you know, fairly recently, there, there are people who see a speaker as a, this is a, an excuse for us to get into a big fistfight with Antifa or vice, and vice versa. And it's just unworkable. It, at least in this day and age, but I think it's unworkable in general. And um, so, you know, those are my thoughts. It's it's ambivalence, but I'm I'm not going to get in the kind of polarized sphere where you either say like, oh, it was the worst thing ever. Those idiots were, it's like, no, there, there was a lot of genuine feeling. The whole movement was behind it. It's totally legitimate to go out and demonstrate in a public place. It Absolutely was, legitimate. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm not going to get into jump on people's back for this at the same time i'm not going to lie about it and say that like there weren't some really bad characters involved with that thing i think and, it was on both sides yeah there were bad people on both sides yeah. to uh, <laughs> misquote donald trump uh so it's it's a complicated thing i mean uh but th- those are those are my my feelings all right um uh, okay guys I'm going to do this. Uh, I am going to switch over to the Substack group. So you guys are already subscribers. We can just jump on into that. Um, I just took a glance at some of the numbers. I don't know if we know a whole heck of a lot, actually. Uh, but I presume the stuff is going to start rolling in. Um, it is uh, almost 9 p.m. on the East Coast, so certainly we're going to have some stuff. So that should be a very fun discussion. We'll probably talk for a number of hours. But anyway, this is a great discussion. Uh, thank you for being involved, and thanks especially to those who contributed. And I will talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.